thank you uh, most kindly for your uh, endurance today and for sticking around. Um, it's been a, a, a power packed day and um, we're uh, very grateful for, um, I think you're going to be uh, very pleased that you, uh, that you stayed till the end today because we've got a, a very distinguished panel. Um, before I introduce them and, and we get started, um, I want to make this as interactive as the Seattle Interactive Conference uh, is, uh, is designed to be and ask you how many in the audience have conducted or, or implemented a mobile campaign uh, at this stage. I see a few hands. How many have done so at the as a client? So marketing your own goods and services. And then how many have done it from a uh, production side or as an agency, for example? We have a few of those as well. How many of you uh, alternately are, are researching the industry now and in the process of planning and uh, analyzing campaign? Very good. And um, here's two easy questions. How many of you have, have, have uh, shopped for products uh, using a mobile device? Just about everybody compared, compared prices. And then how many of you have actually purchased a product via mobile? OK, well, we have a very erudite group here. But uh, perhaps when it comes to mobile, not quite as sophisticated as our audience today, as our, uh, as our distinguished panel today. On the dais, we have um, really uh, four of the power players in uh, the mobile advertising community. Um, I'll do a very brief introduction. Uh, Dan Wright, to my, to my right, is the Director of Product Specialist for Amazon. You can read about all these guys in your program guide, but um, Dan has held uh, leadership positions with Precision Demand, with Emporia, and um, is uh, responsible for leading Amazon sales efforts surrounding emergency advertising, excuse me, emerging advertising products. No, no emergency there. Uh, John Knowles on my... Where are you, John? Right. On, my, on my left, on my left, is general manager at Hip Cricket, the hippest cr cricket in the uh, in the industry, and leads their mobile advertising network. Um, he previously led product management uh, at pr Hip, cr uh, Hip cr Cricket, and I'm going to say that uh, five times fast, and um, has uh, been. Um, actually responsible for the, the launching of the entire mobile initiative um, at, at Hip Critic, uh, Cricket. He's worked at TBWA Shiat Day, and um, as well as a number of other uh, uh, outstanding accounts. Mandar Shinde, to my left, is a, an AOL luminary where he heads mobile uh, monetization um, and is responsible for driving mobile revenue for uh, AOL properties. And um, the distinguished gentleman uh, on my right, um, you may know from his uh, local Seattle uh, uh, digs here. It's Jeremy Lockhorn of Razorfish, and uh, Jeremy leads the emerging media practice there at Razorfish. So today we're going to try to provide a little bit of process and continuity to this, as if you were stepping up to think about how do we um, how do we start the process of planning and, 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 um, and developing a campaign in mobile advertising? And you know, what, are the, what are the choices, what are the options in terms of, um, of creative, um, in terms of media, in terms of network buying? Really, how do we approach the industry um, and, the, and the concept as a whole? And, and let's look at it from a goal standpoint. If there's been a theme today, it's you know, keep the mission in mind, um, you know, lay your plans based on what it is that you want to achieve, and then looking back from the analytic side and the metric side uh, you know, in terms of, of um, you know, where we're going. So Dan, let me start with you. How are you measuring conversion metrics um, on mobile at, at Amazon? Um, <clears throat> well, actually, uh, uh, before I answer that question, it's probably useful just to provide a little context and measurement um, for uh, mobile and how Amazon mm -hmm. thinks about it. So uh, for us, there are really two dimensions upon which we measure campaign success, and it's across all of our properties, not just mobile. So Amazon.com, our owned and operated properties like Amazon.com, IMDb, um, Diapers.com, uh, Zappos, et cetera, uh, as well as uh, what we call Connected Devices, which is the group um, uh, that I lead. Um, connected Devices, Amazon Mobile, IMDb Mobile, um, the Kindle line of products, so Kindle e-readers, Kindle Fire, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we have something called um, the Amazon Advertising Platform, which enables uh, uh, our advertisers to deliver personalized and relevant messages to consumers off of our owned and operated property. So those are the three buckets. And across all three buckets, we want to be consistent in our measurement and in our reporting to clients uh, so they can do an apples to apples comparison across these platforms insofar as possible. So in the connected devices space, we think about measurement on two dimensions. Um, uh, one is 
um, brand metrics. So we think about attitudinal shift in things like aided, unaided awareness, likelihood to um, purchase, likelihood to recommend, uh, and then uh, response metrics. And on the response metrics front, um, we look at, of course, uh, impressions delivered, uh, clicks, click-through rates, and then we also have something which we call uh, considerations. So uh, considerations are unique to Amazon because we have a full funnel view of um, uh, consumer behavior on, on Amazon and on Amazon Mobile and on, on Kindle uh, devices. So how many of you have um, shopped on Amazon? Good, thanks. <laughs> So thanks, that's a softball. So thanks, um, thanks for your business. So um, all of you have probably seen, um, the reason I ask actually is because um, uh, you've probably all seen what we call a product detail page. A product detail page is um, a page on Amazon where we have a description of a product, a picture, ratings and reviews, there's a buy button uh, uh, along, the, along the column there. Um, and so views of those pages we call considerations. And um, increase in consideration rate is tightly correlated with a lift in sales for Amazon. Uh, and in fact, the correlation is somewhere between 70 and 85% or a 0.7 to 0.85. So our advertisers are always looking to consideration uh, and ultimately cost per consideration when they're looking at response metrics to understand how effective their campaign is at driving sales for them. So um, uh, for us, you know, uh, we look at that not only on mobile and as I said before, on site, but we can also do it on Kindle. Um, in Kindle e-readers, in fact, we have what we call buy from device. So there we have the ability to purchase products right from uh, the Kindle e-readers. And again, consideration comes into play there. So our advertisers are looking at what's the consideration rate, what's the cost per consideration across uh, mobile as it relates to Amazon.com and all the other sites and properties that we, that we run. So let me, let me have Jeremy jump in here. And Jeremy, once you are, you've strategized your campaign and you're, you're looking at um, where you want to have this conversion um, in terms of a, of a product detail page, a, 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 a point of conversion, where do you look in terms of, of buying mobile? What are the, the differences between, say, networks, uh, publisher direct, demand side publishing, uh, DSP? Um, how do you uh, stage the campaign or, or start to plot out the campaign in terms of the network choices? Yeah, you know, I think it, it varies based on the objective, right? And, you know, uh, I think if you look at kind of the spectrum of, uh, you know, integration opportunities or um, premium inventory, you know, that tends to be sort of a, a publisher direct type of an environment. Um, and usually, typically, not all the time, but that tends to map back to more brand oriented objectives, right? Like, I want to drive awareness, I want to shift the needle on key brand health metrics, like, uh, you know, is technologically advanced or whatever else. And then, you know, I think uh, we look at, at networks if we're looking for reach, uh, you know, typically um, it tends to be a little bit lower cost. You can get a lot more reach sort of through in a single point of contact. Um, but, you know, again, the opportunities for integration and sort of uh, more contextual, uh, more contextually relevant uh, messages are lower. It's, it's, you can still get there, but it's harder to do on a network versus a publisher direct. And then, you know, in the mobile space, uh, I think DSPs remain, or exchanges, or however you want to categorize this, uh, this bucket, you know, I think that remains a little bit of an oddball to me because I think a lot of them are just sort of glorified networks due to the lack of, you know, consistent cookies and, and you know, uh, device ID type tracking, uh, which sort of limits the value that, uh, you know, when you think about what exchanges can bring in the, on, in the desktop web marketplace, it doesn't translate one to one. So you're not only looking for reach, but you're also looking for sort of transparency. You want um, to get as much information about in terms of targeting as is possible from the networks. And, and what, are the, what are some of the, how does that break out? I mean, in terms of, of CPM in terms of you know value, what are some of the other attributes that you're you're looking for in a network? In a, in a network specifically? In, in, in any in any in any network, yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I think you know CPM certainly factors into it. I think you know I mean we've got a database of kind of all of the mobile players, including networks and publisher direct, and so you know in that we track things like average CPM across campaigns. We track things like historical performance. How how have our clients? Uh, performed on that particular network or publisher in the past. Uh, we track all of their targeting capabilities, so we understand, can I do demo, can I do geo, can I do psychographic behavioral type targeting? Uh, all of those kind of things uh, become important key considerations. That's a beautiful segue over to, uh, to John, because when it comes to targeting customers, and particularly in geolocal, you had my head spinning the other day when we were talking about some of the very... 
ingenious uh, and inventive things that Hip Cricket has done. I can say Hip Cricket now. It's, it's, it's hard, it's but I can, do it. I can do it. Um, uh, can, you, can you describe some of the executional uh, tactics that you've used in terms of targeting? Um, really quite, quite amazing. Yeah, so, so I guess uh, the, to, to echo what you know, Jeremy was saying is we, 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 we tend to start off at the top. We say, so who are, who's our client? Our clients tend to be brands or agencies, more often agencies like a Razorfish. They have objectives, they have KPIs, they have certain things that they're trying to accomplish. And part of that is what we try to do is layer in a unique way to deliver those objectives. And typically it's around targeting. So it can be device targeting, it can be carrier targeting, it can be geo-targeting, it can be things like ambient type targeting. And when I talk about ambient type targeting, it's, uh, it's a way that we uh, try to package a creative way of using targeting around uh, weather temperature or stock quotes or stock price or uh, maybe traffic's bad or there's political things going on or there's certain news topics. But uh, we just did a campaign six, oops, few, probably six months ago for 7-Eleven. And I bring this up because it was an interesting campaign in the fact that they had three really distinct parameters that we had to layer in. One was geo. They had 55 different DMAs that they were interested in. Uh, two was day parting, and three was ambient targeting around weather. So the reason why I throw day parting and ambient in there is uh, they wanted to do 65 degrees and hotter, and Phoenix, for instance, was, was one of the DMAs. This was for Slurpee, right? For Slurpee, that's yes. What you, that's what you yeah, need to you. know. Thank for you for that. Yeah, yeah, so it was for Slurpee. But uh, they wanted to layer that in, and, and, and Phoenix, for instance, is a DMA that you know is, is 65 degrees all day around, you know, long. They don't want to deliver Slurpee ads at 4 in the morning. So they had a 10 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night day parting. They throw it through that 65 degree temperature ambient targeting on top of it, and then they had the geo targeting. But what's important about it is what's cool about mobile is you have a really distinct option to do various things. If you're looking to acquire customers, say like T-Mobile, which is a local company, you can actually target devices, you can target carriers, you could do unique things to really make your media dollar go stronger, be more powerful, really help you achieve your objectives. Yeah, I think that's one of the, I mean, at the end of the day, that what you're describing is context, right? And that is really one of the key differentiators when it comes to mobile versus desktop web is, you know, not that desktop web doesn't have some of that, but you know, the kinds of things that you can bring to the party in terms of really hyper-local, and then you layer on all of those other contextual things, it just helps you deliver so much more of a relevant message. And it, I think that's one of the key differentiators when it comes to mobile. Let me let Mandar uh, jump in here, because when it comes to best practices, um, he is the, uh, the man. Um, uh, you know AOL brands like um, Engadget, like HuffPost, um, major, major uh, attractions and, and um, a tremendous amount of traffic. Mandar, when you're looking at optimizing for mobile once the campaign is underway, and including optimizing monetization, what are some of the guidelines and some of the best practice uh, uh, rules of the road? Right. I mean, you know, advertising, and these gentlemen know this as much as I do, is still a reach and frequency game. It doesn't matter how you look at it. The KPIs haven't changed from an advertiser perspective. The landscape has, right? So, um, you know, let's take two concrete examples, one on the CPA side or one on the brand side. Like, at the end of the day, when a car manufacturer, or let's take movie phone, for example, movies. Studios just care about who is my audience that's going to the movie theater, and like mobile on movies now is a dominant uh, decision maker. So all of the top brands on movies are getting a lot more advertising on mobile, purely because that's where decisions get made. Um, and trends at AOL are very clear where we're seeing, yes, desktop is a research site. Monday to Friday, people are still going. But come Friday, between 4 and 7, which is when decisions get made, you can see major peak traffic in mobile. So we are helping not only just the agencies and the clients understand that data, because we have them, they don't, even though they do, because you know, a lot of tickets are now being bought through mobile. While that's happening, we are helping our own sales force understanding brands have extended. Um, and that's the big part of it, right? As a brand, doesn't matter if it's ours at AOL or yours at a client or Amazon or whatever, they extend across the screens. Um, and so on the brand side of the game, we're helping people understand that that's what it is. It's a reach and frequency game. So if your most engaged user that is, you know, was on Engadget, for example, now has gone to mobile, you're missing out on that user by not targeting that user. So that's how we kind of push the brand play. And at the CP angle, I mean, you know, the awesome and the not so awesome part is there are people, you know, at, at times the carrier business, they want to get clicks and get people to their new devices and their new plans. 
Um, what we are seeing right now is, you know, when they kind of run a campaign cross screen, they're getting way more clicks on mobile than they are on desktop. And we have a play at AOL where we are, you know, automatically optimized for that. So people will automatically, you know, spend more on mobile and tablet than on desktop. And again, what we're seeing are very clear trends on day parts where we see different things. So depending on what kind of the objective is at the client, we are helping both not only the agencies and the clients understand where the user is going, because we do have that data at, at much broader scale from news to tech to, you know, from a content play, um, not only educating them, but also educating our own sales force on what's going on, because at the end of the day, those, you know, both those endpoints need to connect. And, and if you don't mind, I think it's, you know, and I'm sure you, you probably go this direction, but I, I think click-through rate from an audience perspective when you're out there planning is, is a start of the conversation. So when you see clicks and impressions and click-through rate, yeah, you're going to probably see higher in mobile, and we typically see that as well. But click, the click part of it is really the start of the conversation. It's what happens afterwards. So to, to echo Dan and, 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 and what happens in that conversion funnel, it's what do they do after the click? Do they hit the page? Once they hit the page, are they staying? Are they sticking longer? Are they opting in? Are they doing certain things that are beyond that click? And that's really how you should be looking at the success of your campaign and how you should optimize against it. It's not a click-through rate game. It's more on engagement and, and user session and, and opt-ins and things like that beyond the click. So on the subject of tracking installs and post-behavior installs, I know Mandar's carrying a uh, Windows phone, uh, interestingly enough, even though he's come from Pe Palo Alto and, and uh, in the, the pull of the, the Google gravity well. Um, and he also has a, uh, a, new, uh, a new Surface tablet, so congratulations. Um, but what difference between iOS and Android as it relates to cookie level targeting and device fingerprinting? Jeremy, I think you had a, had a um, special focus in this area. What's the difference between iOS and Android when it... it yeah, you know, when it comes to just overall tracking and... Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you know, tracking is a mess in general in the mobile <laughs> space. I mean, Dan, you know, is, has a unique position here because you're, you have sort of a vertically integrated ecosystem, right? And that's great. But outside of that, it's a mess, right? <laughs> uh, and it, so, um, you know, I think it remains a huge challenge on both platforms. Uh, I think it's interesting... You know, uh, Apple, you know, they tend to be secretive with everything, right? Like, uh, their product announcements are super secretive, right? And they're super secretive with developers and advertisers about what they're going to do, right? Like, you know, they, they just pulled the plug on UDID six months ago, a year ago, whatever that was, and that kind of threw the tracking for a loop uh, for iOS downloads, um, as well as other things uh, when it comes to iOS. And then... Then they come with iOS 6, and there's this mysterious ad ID thing that's in there, right? That like you have to go digging through pages and pages of, of you know uh, their developer guidelines to find this thing. And you know I, we we go to our our iAd uh, sales representatives and have conversations with them about that. Like, dude, what's this about? I don't know. I'm gonna have to find out. Like, I have to go and ask a question of somebody. So I think that. Where they're headed seems really interesting. I, I like the transparency that Apple, and for those who haven't read this, they've, they introduced this thing called Ad ID as part of iOS 6, and it's basically intended to be a, a replacement for UDID to enable, uh, I'm assuming, primarily Apple's own network uh, to monitor uh, device level uh, you know, app and, and mobile web consumption uh, for tracking and targeting purposes for advertising. And they have an opt-out uh, as part of the main uh, settings uh, in the in iOS 6. So uh, I like that they've introduced it specifically. I like that they're being transparent with their consumers about it. I, I, what I don't like is that they're not talking to the rest of the industry about it, right? Like, let's all get together and figure it out. Because um, okay. it's great that that maybe will help us on the IAD network, but, you know, we need broader reach than that. Yeah, I mean, it's the first inning, you know. It's, it's early in the ball game, and and John, I know you mentioned that another thing that's creating confusion is third-party tags, right? Yeah, and, 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 and I think, it, it, you know, when you talk about iOS, you talk Android, you talk Windows, you talk feature phone, smartphone, tablet. It's so fragmented, and there's so many different operating systems and so many different device platforms, and all these variants come into play to make it very difficult to have a unique single way to track. I mean, people talk about cookie level targeting and cookie level reporting. They talk about device IDs or device fingerprinting. I mean, that's out there, but if you ask anyone in the space, it's not perfect. There's not a perfect solution yet. And, and I think a lot of folks sitting in, in Jeremy's shoes are, I want that perfect solution. I want that solution that's close to perfect because, you know, nothing's perfect. But it's, it's, a, it's a hard uh, world to grasp. 
back to your qu question on the, 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 the tag side of things, so, so we work with a lot of agencies. Agencies use DoubleClick or you know, Atlas or MediaMind, and there's a cast of other characters, but those are the big three. And they're more often than not, you know, 18 months ago, they weren't bringing a lot of tags to the table because it's like, hey, well, let's do this, let's not tag it. Now, more often than not, they're bringing tags to the table. And, and all I say to that is, is, is one, I encourage it. You, you, you should do it. It's something that gives you control or at least a test and measure or you know, compare and contrast method. But because of all the fragmentation, all the different devices, depending on what you're doing and from a targeting perspective, it became, becomes challenging in some cases, meaning there can be large discrepancies. If you're targeting feature phones, you're targeting latency devices, if you're having large daisy chains or multiple daisy chains within those redirects, it can cause some problems. But at the end of the day, because you're held accountable with your client, put them in, but understand what you're getting into. And my company, uh, Hip Cricket, we work with our agencies to have logins to like a double click or an atlas. So when a campaign is tagged, and more often than not they are to th these days, what we do is try to optimize against that. So you know, it's not a perfect world. If you look at IAB and four a, the four A's in an IO, they allow 10% variance, that happens. It happens in mobile, and sometimes it happens larger. Just keep an eye on it, I encourage you to use them. I encourage you to work with your network partner or your publisher to make sure that that discrepancy is really tight. And if it's not, optimize against it and quickly. So let me open this up to the whole panel. What about the tension between apps and, and the mobile web? Because um, there was a report that just came out um, uh, this week, actually, um, from Opera that talked about um, the, the, the pull between the, on their ad platform between apps and, and web, and it was um, predominantly apps. Apps took the top spot generating 73% of revenue within their particular ad platform. But I think that at this particular time, and maybe this is an iPad phenomenon, um, Dan, I know Amazon has great apps, I mean great shopping apps, and a number of those. Um, how do you guys different, differentiate that? Is the action going to be, you know, do you, need to, do you need to produce an app, or do you need, can you, do you need to do cross-screen or cross-app, or how, how, do, how do you fit that, those pieces together? Yeah, so for us at Amazon, we always, and uh, someone on the men, uh, panel mentioned it, we always think about um, where are our, our consumers, and uh, so we want to be where they are. Consumers are, you know, multimodal at this point uh, from a shopping experience perspective, and, and, um, uh, and so what I mean by that is, um, as, as was discussed earlier, they'll be on their PC during the day, and then, um, you know, they'll go on their mobile device, they'll be on their uh, Kindle in the evening, sitting on the couch or lying in bed. And they don't care, um, <clears throat> consumers don't care what channel they're communicating uh, with us through, right? So if they add um, a product to their cart on the web when they're at work, and then they're on their uh, mobile phone on the way home, on the, on the bus or on the train, they want to review their, their shopping cart, and then later when they're uh, on the couch, they want to buy on their Kindle, we need to create an experience across all those platforms um, uh, wherever they want to operate. Right. And and um, and so whether it's app or web, you know, we, we have both, of course. Um, and from an advertising perspective, the way we think about it is, um, of course, we run media or ads across all these platforms. Like I said before, you know, Kindle Fire, Kindle e-readers, mobile apps, mobile websites, um, uh, you know, obviously online. Um, because when we see consumers um, behave, consumer behavior across these platforms, what we find is that the ones, the consumers who buy across platform, spend more. Um, than those who buy in a single uh, single channel, and and that experience across platforms as an advertiser, um, you want to be there um, to participate in that. We ran a study, for example, with Levi's, where uh, we had uh, a, a couple of different groups we were testing. We had a group that just received ads on mobile, a group of customers that just received ad received ads on PCs, and then a group of customers that received ads on both. And what we saw is that uh, the lift in consideration, uh, the metric I was lit, um, I mentioning earlier. Uh, for those that saw ads on both platforms, uh, in, the, in the both platform group had 20 to 30 percent higher consideration rates on mobile and on, on PC than those who were just uh, individual in those channels. So going back to your question about apps versus mobile web, for us, you know, we need to be in both places because our customers are in both places. And I think um, you know, my recommendation to others would be to do the same because customers, you know, to them, it's all just communicating with a brand or a, or a, a site. Go ahead. So, yeah, so you know, being a content company, I mean, what we can say clearly is we are seeing more app users being self-selecting in the sense the, you know, if you look at the user base, it starts with, I love the brand, I care about the brand, 
oh, I'll read it if it's from a brand, and then I'll touch it because it showed up on my search. So depending on which tier you belong to, you're gonna see the self-selecting on the app. Again, I'm talking content. Content is a small piece of the end, like you know, you're talking shopping, you're talking games. The 73% revenue comment, on the other hand, like is a, is a bit different because look at it the way mobiles develop, right? It's a prim primarily it's a utility slash gaming platform. You don't have that on the desktop, which is why you're seeing a slight difference there where apps are garnering more revenue. I mean, we can debate on the topic of tablet because tablets dominantly, I expect it to be a browsing device because the larger the screen size, the chances of you being on a browser are higher. So we can debate the revenue comment over a period of time, but I think that's more self-selecting today, purely because games on web just don't, will just not perform as well. That's why you're seeing that revenue. I think that it'll flatten out and probably as we see more and more fragmentation, we'll probably see more, you know, again, Contrary to what Mark Zuckerberg says, we'll see more websites being developed. Because not everything is about interactivity, a lot of it is just consumption. Now when it comes to rich media, I know you had, uh, were a very early innovator and I think did something at was it Yahoo yep. with, uh, with Shrek of all creatures and uh, it was highly interactive. Can you, can you tell us about what, what was unique about that? I think we all have held the record for the first sort of responsive, interactive. Right. Um, yeah, no, so this was about three years yeah. back when Shrek 2, I think more Shrek 3 came out. Shrek 1? Yeah, <laughs> we were trying to figure out how to use Shrek the touch two. screen and this, because you know, people tend to scroll a lot more than they click. And what we managed to create more just because we wanted to trial, and this is way ahead of iAds time, so you can tell the time frame was a bit early. We managed to create an experience where based on how users were consuming our sites, we created an experience that Shrek could hide and play and things like that. So he's hiding in the browser or something? Yeah, so it felt like every time you were scrolling, the Shrek kind of hid under. And what we found was half of the people who came to movies.yahoo.com went all the way to the bottom looking for Shrek. <laughs> the recall on this was tremendous. The click-through was like beyond amazing. Right. And those are the possibilities. So from a rich media perspective, you know, touch is bringing new possibilities. So is the orientation piece. And I think we haven't even touched that yet, so we're at literally at the infancy of that, and I think that's gonna create brand recall and interactive rates beyond our imagination. And before we leave touch and tablets altogether, um, late breaking news is of course the, the iPad mini. Um, we've had the Android uh, ne Nexus tab out at the seven inch size. This is a little bit bigger. Um, but it's also uh, pixel rich, right? It's a ret ret the retina screen. How do we think this is gonna change the user experience and, and what is this gonna fa maybe facilitate that, that we haven't seen, if anything, thus far? Any thoughts on any, is it gonna turn things dramatically in either direction? People are gonna be holding it a lot closer because it's, <laughs> you know, the resolution is the same, but it's a smaller screen, so you're gonna, no, I, I mean, um, I, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be convenient for uh, for reading, right? I mean, yeah. that's why uh, that's why the Kindle is is that size. That's why the Kindle Fire is roughly that size. Um, but I, I don't know that it's going to really completely change the way that people interact with tablets. You know, I think there's still going to be uh, the um, you know the phone is for portability and the tablet is for you know kind of. Our, the uh, uh, CIO uh, of Viviki, uh, Rashad Tabakawala, has this great quote that I have been using ever since I heard, first heard it, so I stole this right from him, but tablet is the first computer uh, that was designed to be used while slouching. Uh, and I think it's very true. And I don't think that's gonna change with the, with the iPad mini. Yeah, I think we ran a research, and happy to share that study as well, but what we found was the 10 inch is like a multi-user tablet, shared between family, more in the you know, coffee table style, while the seven inch is more on the go. So it's almost your smartphone when you don't want to use one and you need more screen space. Uh, but and, and the more we interviewed people at AOL and outside of it, I think that definition is starting to show up more as, yeah, I think that's more like it. Um, so one is very much enterprise class and one is very much kind of home, home usage. Well, not to play favorites or, or be biased, but Apple s seems to have been the, you know, the, uh, the big player here and the top device in, in monetization performance. Um, I think I have a second quarter report here, or maybe this is the third quarter. Average cost per thousand impressions, $2.85. Android is a close second. Everyone else trails. Why, does it, why is it that Apple is driving 61% according to this study of global mobile ad revenue in Q2, is it just a c c game of catch up at this point for other, other platforms like, like the Kindle, like, uh, like Android, Windows? I mean, <laughs> well, I, I'll is it my, early mover? My senior <laughs> perspective, I'm, there's a gentleman from Amazon who I'll let reply on Kindle, but uh, so 
it's for me, it's the reach issue, right? Like at the end of the day, there's more Android phones, but doesn't mean you're getting more Android usage. Right. So from a reach and consistency perspective, you're getting a lot more of iOS than you're getting from Android. That's our perspective and what we're seeing at AOL. So that's why you're getting that. Because at the end, it's, like I said, it's still a reach and frequency game. And the, and the second thing is the consistency in creative. You get a lot more consistent creative on iOS than you get on Android. So you can still run a double, pick, like double PPI on you know, everything ranging right. from 3GS all the way to 5 now um, using one creative. And, and I think that's driving a lot more of it because we see the same issue where advertisers are not yet willing to give the full range. And that automatically kind of limits what you do. But again, I think that answer is all debatable. I'm debating the metric itself. Like 285 sounds very high to me, but okay. fine. You can you can uh, inspect these numbers uh, <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, the, other, the other thing that's inter other thing that's interesting is is where you know you replace advertising, and we're talking about stickiness or or we're talking about uh, engagement. Um, depending on dwell time and interaction and rates, um, this speaks to the whole rich media conversation. Um, the the studies are showing that. Calendar activity, photo activity, video activity um, tends to um, you know raise uh, uh, click through and, 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 and engagement. Um, are you guys are you guys correlating those kind those 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 kinds of um, content uh, specifications when you're recommending making recommendations to clients? Yeah, we are. Again, again it, it it stems back to what what's your product, what's your audience, what are you trying to accomplish, but. Um, you know, a lot of times mobile is that on the go. There's a lot of social interaction. There's a lot of ties to that, so it it makes it relevant. So we uh, find when we're building either a mobile site or an app or a rich media ad unit or whatever it may be, or all of the above, uh, we uh, get a lot of requests to include Facebook and Pinterest and Twitter, and it, it really depends on what you're trying to do. So we yeah. try to we try to make sure we control it because if you start having all these links in your banner ad and all these things going on, it becomes a lot of it becomes very convoluted. So um, the short answer is yes, we see a lot of this, these requests. Uh, the long answer is that we tie back and say, hey, listen, what are you trying to accomplish? How do you make this thing happen? And then ultimately, we make the best decision. And it may be a banner ad leading to a landing page with that landing page having these links to have that social interaction to it. But it really just depends on what you're trying to do. And, and, and mobile is a on-the-go, fast, really soundbite type environment. If you're putting a banner ad there with a lot to talk about, a lot of call to action, you're, you're basically wasting your time. You've got to be very short, succinct, get them to do one action, not multiple actions, and, and make it happen in a, in a quick fashion. And Mano, you're probably measuring against um, those great Huffington Post page views and engaged, engaged readers as to you're comparing mobile specs in those, in those environments. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the first point that we went through, which is contextual and like day parting are the most key. So what we find is rich media or not, I mean, having a better resolution ad by nature clicks better. Because most of the ads start small and then you expand them to get to rich media. Um, obviously, context matters. So if you have a movie ad on movie phone or a tech ad on that, do the best. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we see is, um, and I think we just released yet another research on this, like most of the smartphone time is actually at home. So if you were to target between 6 and 10, doesn't matter if it's a tablet or mobile phone, that's when these ads start becoming really relevant and really engaging. And then there's the other vertical on like, hey, hang on, print's also coming back to tablet, which is the long form part of it. That's where we're really hitting the ball because you can build an ad, like a full page ad, um, really truly interactive, works online, offline. Well, now you're talking three, four minutes engagement because people will consume it as content. So it, it, it's debatable on how we look at it, but I agree with him. Like at the end of the day, when you're on the go, yeah. short, relevant, quick message to the point is the best, irrespective of what the ad is. And then as the time kind of goes into PM, that changes into more interactivity. Great, great. Well, part of the benefit of having four people that speak as fast as, as, as we do uh, and, and help cover so much ground so quickly is I'd really like to open it up uh, early and give you a nice healthy Q&A period here. If you guys have questions about your own campaigns of these um, terrific uh, experts, um, there's a mic here uh, and halfway um, back. And um, you know, please address your questions to the group generally or any of our distinguished speakers. Hi, Dan. Um, how do you define consideration for Amazon? Yeah, so, uh, so the question was how do we uh, define consideration for Amazon? So a consideration is a view of a product detail page. So uh, as I mentioned um, earlier, it's a, um, it's a page that has uh, 
a, um, a picture of a product, uh, ratings and reviews, it has the buy button on it, or um, uh, you know, purchase now with one click uh, capability. Those are, those are considerations for us. Don't be bashful. <laughs> We could cover it tomorrow. Is it, raise, raise of hands. Is anybody using Facebook mobile ads in our audience today? At all trying that? It, there, is somebody in the way, way back? Oh, way, way back. Yes? Could, could, can you tell us about it? <laughs> no, I mean, well, what, what um, are you using sponsored stories? I understand that's uh, very effective um, or more effective. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends on what your, what your goals are and what you're yeah. You did, in profusely, thank you very much. That's, 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 that's excellent. You, you should be up here, actually. You come, come on up. <laughs> um, I think, actually, it's th 13 times more, more um, uh, CTR than, um, than the uh, as desktop ads, which is really, really quite remarkable. Good for f Facebook mobile. Speaking of another revelation of Facebook, which is remarketing, how does that translate into to mobile and looking at a cross-screen, multi-screen, cross-platform, if you will, strategy? In other words, um, I'm on the consideration page, Dan, and um, will I see remarketed ads to that product when I travel to other Amazon pages, other Amazon properties? Um, how does that work? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about um, uh, just Amazon uh, targeting generally and, and, and start by saying, of course, we never use PII. Everything is done at the aggregate level in terms of the targeting data that we use. But we build audiences um, um, that we uh, deliver personalized ads to based on their browse and purchase behavior. Mm -hmm. So if you come to Amazon, it's regardless of the, of course, again, of the, of the medium you're on, whether you're on a mobile device or uh, on your PC or on your Kindle device, uh, uh, you know, if you're browsing in the electronics category or if an audience is browsing in the electronics category, then um, presumably they're interested in electronics products. And so we'll deliver uh, relevant messages to them in whatever channel that they're operating in again. So, <clears throat> right, so if you're on your Kindle Fire again, or if you're on, you know, your Kindle e-reader, you might get um, uh, relevant uh, personalized ads for that. And the reason, one of, I mean, there are presumably a, a number of obvious reasons for this, but one for us at Amazon is that um, discovery is very important to us for consumers, right? We offer millions of products across dozens of categories. And um, uh, we want to make it easy for consumers to identify or find products that are interesting to them, that are relevant to them. And so having this um, data in aggregate to deliver personalized and relevant messages of products via advertising that they may not have been aware of before uh, uh, delivers a lot of value to them and then in turn becomes valuable to advertisers, right? Um, uh, and the other thing I'll say, kind of going back to the creative piece that, you, that we were discussing earlier, is that not only delivering relevant um, content um, or personalized content that consumers through that through those ads, but also integrating content into the ads um, uh, helps that engagement. So we were talking earlier about what are the functionalities that you might put in advertisements for us. One of the uh, key reasons um, consumers come to Amazon is for the ratings and reviews. And uh, so we have something that we call e-commerce ads. We do this on site. We're bringing it, uh, bringing it to mobile where uh, we'll put um, star ratings right in the uh, ad placement 
uh, and the number of reviews that have been provided so that consumers can see that right in the ad rather than having to click and go deeper. And we find that the engagement on these e-commerce ads tends to be 20, 30 percent higher than um, standard uh, creative. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sort of the rich snippet, if you will, the rich snippet of mobile ads, that's really, really has to How about, uh, John, are, you, are your networks uh, and, the, and the campaigns you're recommending that they feature remarketing, is that kind of um, stocking of, of that, that's that's essentially what Hip Cricket uh, cut its teeth on. I mean, we uh, in 2004 we've been around for a little over eight years. Uh, we started as an SMS company, and we do a lot of remarketing through opting in through a banner ad, opting in at a mobile site, uh, then later remarketing through like SMS. Uh, providing offers, deals, things like every, every week you get an SMS message. So that, that happens all the time. Uh, we as a company try to, you know, when I was talking about social and mobile and bridging that gap, we try to make mobile part of the, the marketing channel. So it's not this standalone one-legged stool. It's how does mobile fit into your social? How does it fit into your digital? How does it fit into your traditional uh, and how do we weave that through there so there's a, if there's a QR code in your print uh, ad or an SMS message or is there something to you know really kind of weave that gap because mobile is a nice way to help provide measurability across all different channels of, of, of media and we provide that so with that said is once you've interacted with an ad we have the remarketing in place to continue that dialogue and that conversation. Jeremy tell me about a Razorfish campaign that you're uh, particularly fond of or that um has, um, has sort of hit the ball out of the park. Uh, yeah, and I'll just kind of build on some of the stuff that John was just talking about. Totally agree with all of that, you know, and I think that's one of the strengths of mobile is, you know, it, it is a discrete advertising channel in and of itself, right? But it's also the connective tissue that, that can bridge the gap between all of the other channels, right? Whether it's SMS or QR code or, or whatever else, right? And, and uh, increasingly, uh, you know, I think consumers are expecting to, to move uh, from one device to the next seamlessly. So I think even kind of cross-device retargeting is really uh, important and interesting. And, you know, you guys, again, have <laughs> a great closed ecosystem for that or sort of, sort of closed ecosystem for that. But we've been experimenting with other um, technologies that will enable that, right? So I deliver an ad to somebody on a PC. Uh, they don't buy right away. I may see them again on a mobile phone. I can deliver an ad there, you know, and try to re-engage them. Uh, so, but to, to answer your question specifically, um, we did a campaign uh, around March Madness for one of our clients, who I unfortunately can't name, but, uh, you know, we, we tapped into, I think, one of the other big trends in the mobile space, which is uh, using the phone or a tablet while you're watching television. So, uh, you know, and sports is one of the biggest genres where this is happening, right, just because it's so, uh, it's so easy to talk about it via social and it's also so data rich, you know, you want to be fact checking things that the announcer is saying and looking up player stats and other scores and all that kind of stuff. So during something like March Madness, there's just a ton of mobile engagement. So uh, this particular client was a big sponsor of um, the broadcast games on television. And so we worked with several mobile companies uh, to kind of surround the user uh, around that experience. And so, you know, we were delivering ads on TV and ads on mobile uh, simultaneously. And we conducted a study to, to understand, you know, what that does. Um, and, you know, the, the results uh, were really interesting. And, you know, I think that um, it, it doesn't do a whole lot. The second screen doesn't do a whole lot to boost uh, top of mind awareness, uh, which makes sense, right? Like that's that's what TV is really good at. Uh, but what it does is it makes everything that's on TV work harder, right? So we saw big lifts in all kinds of brand health metrics, including most importantly, uh, purchase consideration. So, uh, you know, I think that's that's really really interesting, and we're going to continue to see a lot of experimentation there. So that is the second screen, isn't it? With television, I mean, we're sitting there not with a with a desktop, but a laptop or. or Tablet uh, and, and your phone. Yep. And so, yeah, that. Qu question? Yeah, my question is sort of similar going off to what you guys are talking about, and maybe this is more for Dan. Um, I'm the type of Amazon guy who you know, searches online at work and then goes on the bus and adds things to my cart, and then I don't feel too comfortable buying things on my phone, so then maybe I go to my computer and purchase them. Are there certain ways that you guys are seeing a trend in people per, like finishing the purchase on the computer rather than a phone or a tablet? And are there any ways that you guys are kind of bringing that experience from a desktop to a mobile? And what are some of the ways that you guys are 
kind of trying to bring that together? Uh, okay, so so for us at Amazon, as I mentioned before, of course, we're you know, consumers are engaging with us across channels, and their expectations of us are similar across channels. So we're trying to create um, experiences that um, appeal, um, or um, I should say, uh, mimic or have a similar uh, look and feel across uh, channels, but are appropriate for the different modes, right? Um, you know, the screen size on a, on a phone just creates, a, um, a, you know, less real estate, um, uh, frankly, to, to do things than obviously a, a PC screen. But what that means for advertisers uh, in a lot of instances, and, and this is my hypothesis, I don't have data to support this, that the, the click-through rates or the tap-through rates that you see on, that we see on ads on Amazon Mobile, for example, average between one and 2%, right? Whereas I was at a conference recently where one of the folks speaking was saying that what they see on average is a 0.15% click-through rate on, on PCs. And I think that's um, one of the reasons is because, you know, it takes up a, a sizable piece of the screen where the advertisement is, um, and there's not a lot, of, a lot of clutter there. There's just not a lot of real estate. So in the context of how are we creating experiences across devices, um, uh, for our customers, you know, it, it just goes back to customer obsession for us and how do we um, do things for customers in these different um, environments that have a consistent um, feel or experience uh, uh, that appeals to their needs. You know, in terms of data that we've seen from consumers doing research on their phones and purchasing on PC, I haven't seen any data related to that specific topic, so I can't speak to that. Um, but, I, but we do see really high engagements in the, in the connected device space, on tablets and mobile in particular, higher, higher so than we see in, in a lot of other channels. The other thing, like Kindle, same, same experience as mobile for us, where no, the, the creative is quite a bit different. We want to have a non-interruptive um, uh, creative integrated into the experience. So if you think of a Kindle e-reader, it's a screensaver. When you pick up the device, you consume the media as part of your process of just turning on the device, unless you're doing it with your eyes shut. Um, when you turn on the device and you go into a book, we never introduce um, ads in that space. We don't want to interrupt that process. But it's, what's, what's interesting about that is that that experience that I just described is required viewing, but it's not interruptive, right? And so again, the engagement there, it's a, it's a different experience. It's a different channel. So it's a different way the media is presented to you versus what you might see on your PC or your mobile. Um, but then the engagement there is very high, again, averaging 1% click-through rate, uh, up to 2% click-through rates on, on that kind of media. So, and while the point earlier is, is well taken, it's not all about the click-through rate, um, you know, driving the considerations, which we do on all of these channels, also very high, in fact, highest and most efficient on those um, uh, connected devices. So um, anyway, you know, I don't have specific data to share with you other than what we're seeing in terms of customer engagement based on the uh, experiences that we're trying to build there. So in the last 10 minutes, if there are no more questions, let me ask you guys, when you go back to your offices uh, uh, tomorrow, and in, as we turn the corner into 2013, what's the next, uh, the next big event to come? What's the next um, tipping point, if you will, or the, the, the new development that is gonna really trigger the industry? Uh, John, you were talking the other day that, that there really needs to be kind of a, uh, a, a, key, a key moment um, in, in the industry to sort of tip the, the balance. And given the amount of money that's being spent, which is, which is enormous, um, you know, why, why are the major brands still a little, a little hesitant and still, uh, t you know, tentative? What needs to happen yeah. to take it to the next level? So, so uh, major brands are, are, are stepping into mobile aggressively. I mean, you walk outside and you look at how people are digesting content and, and interacting with uh, their device. It's everywhere. Uh, the challenge is that, and, and there's statistics and things out there that, uh, you know, Advertising budgets, 1% of advertising is going into mobile where they think that based on the content consumption, it should be near 7 to 10%. So there's not a ton of money going in there yet. So people are using it on a trial basis. And a trial from one brand could be 10K to 200K to 1 million. It really depends on the size of the brand. But what I think is the uh, so-called tipping point, it, it, it comes down to uh, measurability and providing them with proof points. And I, I think there's a lot of people out there that can 
say we can do these things and say we can provide conversion metrics and do this stuff. And it's out there. It just needs to get better and more crisper. And, and, and I know what's happening and people are working on it. So what I would say is embrace mobile. People are digesting content via mobile. It's a great way to target people. The data and analytics are not necessarily precise, but they're getting better and they're getting better faster. And they're going to be able to tell a story. Once that story is in place, then more and more money will start to come to, to the table. It's all about ROI. Um, quick question for Jeremy. Um, how would you go about structuring a buy? How would you advise someone to go about structuring a mobile buy um, when they already know the audience they want and they, they don't have the budget for Comscore and mobile ends and all of that? Um, you know, how do they look at different applications? Are there planning tools you recommend? Um, how much time do you have? Oh, well, yeah. Well, if you could even throw out maybe a couple free planning tools or ranks of apps or things that you think are really helpful. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's going to depend, obviously, on, on who you are and what your objectives are. You know, I hate to say that, but uh, that's true. Um, so, and I don't mean to use that as a cop-out, but so, uh, you know, if you don't have access to a comm score, which can help you to assess that, then I think, you know, go on to uh, some of the big uh, partners, uh, either publisher, director, or networks who, who really know the stuff, they know their audience, they know their, uh, you know, they know their inventory uh, is another good way, right? Like, go to a hip cricket or go to a millennial or go to a, you know, Google ad mob or somebody like that. They can help you to understand the audience uh, as well or go to an agency uh, who can help to understand the audience. Um, uh, yeah, and, and so, you know, from there, it's really just kind of, you know, I think mapping the audience against your objectives and what it is that you're trying to get done and, and finding kind of where are those unique connection points that I can reach this audience. Um, that's so generic, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and, and I'll just add in, in, in a little bit more, and it's, the, you don't know how many times I answer, it depends, because really there's not a lot of single threaded answers for this business. There's a lot of ways to skin a cat, which is good, because you can be creative. There's a lot of ways to approach it. But when I plan or build plans for our clients, I typically uh, go at it with the, the thought in mind of blending uh, a, a lot of different options. Again, depends on your budget, but if you have, let's say, a $50,000 budget, I would recommend some transparent sites, some semi-blind where you're buying channels of a bunch of sites together, buying CPM and buying CPC, so you can blend that down and have an effective CPM, and also look at various different creative units so you can test. So you're not just out there testing one or two items, you have more of a uh, an education piece to take back to your team and have learnings to, to you know, use and parlay into your next campaign. So building a, a, a plan that has multiple different tenants to it, CPM, CPC, different creative units, different publishers, things like that that will really help you have some key learnings to, to build on uh, going forward. Uh, mind the tipping point? Is it, is it the proof, proof points we're talking about that will make, mark the tipping point? I mean, you know, so I agree to some of the points you made and the fact that measurement's a big kind of headache that we need to sort out, even though I think it's an industry problem, not necessarily an advertiser problem. I don't, however, buy the fact that all advertisers are on mobile yet. I think what we are seeing is we are seeing snippets of, oh, I'm launching a car, I'm going to do something mobile specific. What we don't see is continuity and strategy which is I know exactly what my mobile strategy is and I know how each new campaign is going to get launched. And once we see that, these guys, you know, sitting in the agencies will like, okay, I'm committed to mobile, um, so I'm going to go figure this out with you. And then that's where you're going to see it. Because what I see and, you know, I've worked with you guys and worked with IPG and a lot of different guys, at the end of the day, what we are seeing is more a, hey, we take it to the client, the client nods their head, and they kind of send back, okay, but tell me, can you guarantee this will work? And it's almost like, how can a new be guaranteed? Because, you know, guarantee comes when you're in it for five and ten years, and you know exactly what the data is, you know exactly what the campaign's going to do. What everybody does agree, though, is like, hey, mobile's here to stay, it's going to be the new big thing, we're going to go into it. It's more the, you know, how can we solve the privacy issues, you know, the policies around measurement, you know, the consistency, I, I think those things will get solved. Once the clients make up their mind that mobile's a big part of my strategy, we're not seeing that today. We're seeing that on entertainment guys and studios and TV fronts. We're seeing somewhat on the auto side. Finance is trying to get there as well, but more on the app download side, but we're not seeing it consistently across the board saying mobile's part of my integral strategy. When that happens, I think the problems will get solved because there'll be a lot of money flushing into the market. Yeah, yeah, uh, totally agree. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, you know, yeah, I think the metrics and the ROI is kind of key, and you know, I think John kind of touched on this as well. But you know, as we talked about earlier, the the, the measurement is still kind of messy. There's a lot of discrepancy issues, and and that can create challenges. So I think that. Uh, you know, for a lot of the early advertisers that we had dabbling in mobile, you know, five and six years ago, uh, you know, those guys, the conversation that we had with them at the time was like, well, let's rethink what ROI means, right? Like, let's let's put some value on the learning that we're going to get out of this, uh, and and make that kind of front and center because we know that this thing is going to scale, and you know that learning will be extremely valuable, um, you know, and a competitive advantage as as it grows, and you know. That, you know, some of them bought into that, and now they're spending 15, 20% of their digital display budgets on mobile, right? So I think that's the kind of thing we just have to continue to have those conversations and work with the metrics that we can get to, to build those stories. I didn't ask earlier, but are there any developers out there? Are there any Android developers in particular? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Really? Talk to me. I have a lucrative project for you. <laughs> I'd be happy to share. Um, these, this is uh, uh, the, the, the early days, so to speak, and um, it's interesting um, that, um, well, I think you've gotten a lot of, of great perspectives here from, um, from, our, from our panel. Um, could we make, make a last call for any, any additional questions? We have one? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, how does, how does social media play into mobile advertising? Like, is it very important to incorporate social media or social awareness and how important is that to base businesses if you can guarantee that okay well I have a social issue that is very pressing and I can go here is that important to advertisers or they, they don't care as long as it's something that works for mobile I think it's tremendously important uh, you know uh, Zuckerberg you know recently didn't he say something like we're now a mobile company uh, so you know, I, and you know, you're seeing more and more social network consumption uh, happen on mobile phones. So I think that uh, you know, we've all been saying for years that social is very soon going to be a part of everything that we do. Uh, I would argue that we're we're hearing more and more about the same on mobile. So you know, I think uh, you have to. They, they are totally intertwined, and I think it has to be a consideration at all times. I don't know so if, if that you answers could, your question or not. If you could do something like the Coney, how Coney went viral. Would it be, is it social issues or just social awareness or is it more just social media? Which one would be the most important to try to tackle if you were yeah, developing it, apps? It, it, it's the seeding of it, right? Like when you go, I mean, social is more of a, it's a pipe, right? Who's seeding into the pipe is almost as important as like, you know, which pipe you're plugging into. So, I mean, I definitely don't agree on the, like, you know, the whole Facebook like thing. Like everybody's just like Facebook like, and I'm like, really? Um, but it's more the, when you share it, like, you know, one of the big ch you know, things for us when we sell Engadget is we believe there's a whole lot of content that is in the, like, you know, the early nerdy, like, who get it, they're looking at the early trends. The reason advertisers go there is because they're expecting that set of people to kind of put it into those pipes because a lot of the followers are, hang on, if this guy said it, that makes sense and I'm gonna pass it along. So I think social is more of a pipe and I agree like with Jeremy 100% that it's a very important pipe at that, like you need it to be viral, but also the seeding and the context of how we got there is probably the more important part, right? Okay. Um, I, I think I strongly believe in that. One, one final question that kind of ties into content question and so forth. How many of you that have websites that have a mobile presence have mobile independent websites. In other words, not just responsive design, but have a separate mobile site and a separate desktop site. Can you answer that? Is that in the form of a question? How many, how many of you have a separate mobile site or unique mobile site? So all of your sites are both desktop and, and, and mobile. What is, what is your opinion on that the panel as far as do you need to create a, so, a mobile only site that makes it you know, that's location centric and that's easier to search, uh, you know, where directional and so forth, find directions. I think, you know, I, I hate to say it again, but I think it depends. Um, mm -hmm. I think the theory of responsive design is fantastic. I think in practice it presents a lot more challenges, uh, you know, once you kind of dig under the hood. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's about figuring out, like, can I get everything done that I want to get done uh, to satisfy my consumer's mobile needs from my brand via responsive or am I better off, you know, building a dedicated site? 
And you know, one of the key factors there is going to be load time, right? Uh, and that's one of the, the problems with responsive design is that you're still loading these giant images in a lot of cases. And you know, what's the data? Is it like three to five seconds is like the, the threshold before somebody's going to close and go away? So I, I think that uh, I think it depends. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your, your turning out. Thank you, Q. Thanks. Thanks.